Satoma Sad Gamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrittorma Amritangamaya Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, lead us from death to immortality. Om Shanti 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 Hi. Peace, peace, peace. Good morning. And happy Easter. Now, it's become a tradition in our Vedanta centers to acknowledge Easter. Early this morning, we had a Christ Puja at 6.30. I admit I'm not a morning person. I wasn't here for that. But that got the day off to a start. And customarily, the talk on Easter Sunday also is related to the spiritual significance of the Christian holiday. And this shows that the Vedanta tradition itself has a willingness to accept and respect and honor other religious traditions. This speaks of the Vedantic breadth of spirit. <clears throat> now, this universality is not derived from dogma or creed, but from the direct experience. This is the direct experience of the divine that the Hindu scriptures teach of. And there's a word for that direct experience. It's mysticism. Now, mysticism can mean a communion with the divine or even a full union with the divine. And there are various means to attain this state of awareness, such as spiritual love, contemplation, or development of an intuitive knowledge. <clears throat> now, the beautiful thing about direct experience is that it transcends every boundary, even the boundaries that separate one religious tradition from another. And every religion has its mystic. These are the knowers, the people who have had that experience. And they try to transmit it to others through the language, the metaphors, and the symbols of their particular religious traditions, their cultures. But ultimately, we recognize that the experience is the same, for God is one. So this is an experience of the supreme unity. And this is the birthright of every human being to know the divine reality residing in every heart, eternally present, just merely awaiting discovery. It's there. And there are two words that come to mind at this point. One of them is familiarity, and the other is freshness. Familiarity, because we know the teachings of our own tradition. Familiarity also because we hear them echoed in the teachings of other traditions. We recognize that what we're talking about, they're talking about. But at the same time, there's a freshness because suddenly we're hearing it from a slightly different standpoint, in different vocabulary, expressed from a different, slightly different point of view. And this can only round out our own vision. So familiarity and freshness are the key words here. Now, today I'm not going to talk about Easter. But I am going to talk about a mystic of the Christian tradition. He was a mystic who described his own inner discovery in highly concentrated poems. They were written in German. They were little poems of two lines each, bold couplets that contain worlds of meaning just ready to burst forth in our awareness as we contemplate them. I like to call these Christian sutras because sutras are these very, very concentrated forms of teaching in the Hindu tradition. And these Christian sutras come from a work called The Cherubinic Wanderer, which was published under the name Angelus Silesius. Now, in the original German, these verses are only two lines long, but the translator who rendered them into English in 1932 found that there was so much meaning packed into each one of them that he expanded them into verses of four lines each. And at the same time, he tried to preserve the archaic tone of these um, older verses. So keep that in mind as I read them, that this is antiquated language. 
Now, I'm going to start by giving you a preview, just a foretaste, and there will be plenty more of these poems to come. But for the moment, here's one that describes the mystic's astonishment at the immensity of the divine. Turn wheresoever I will, I find no evidence of end, beginning, center, or circumference. Now, Angelus Silesius has had a glimpse of the infinite, and he's astounded. He has experienced something that transcends the limitations of time and space. He says there's no beginning, there's no end, there's no center, there's no circumference. And this recalls a frequently invoked image of God. It's so old and it's been repeated so many times and attributed to so many different thinkers, philosophers, saints, nobody knows who originated it. But it's an image that defines God as a circle or a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. I'm sure that a great many of you have come across this in your reading. Now, so that we can appreciate uh, Angelus Silesius a little better, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction into his life and times. He was born Johannes Scheffler in 1624, and he was the son of a Lutheran nobleman. He was baptized on Christmas Day in the city of Breslau, which was the capital of Silesia, which today is in southwestern Poland. At the time, Silesius was inhabited by Germans, and for the past hundred years or so, they had been Lutherans. So they were a product of the uh, Martin Luther's Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. But two centuries before Luther, this part of Silesia had been a center of a movement of mystical spirituality among the Roman Catholics, among the Catholic laity in particular. And this was driven underground by the church authorities. This movement stemmed from Meister Eckhart, the great Catholic mystic. He was a Dominican monk who had been charged with heresy. And here's what he was charged with heresy for. For teaching that the soul is closer to God than it is to the body. And that the truth, the soul, truth, soul and truth, the relationship is so intimate that in the highest state, no difference between the soul and God can be discerned. So this, this was a statement that got a mystic in trouble. The soul is closer to God than it is to the body, and in truth so intimate that in the highest state, no difference between the soul and God can be discerned. So this is very much a mystical statement. Angelus wrote another verse, which I'll quote here. Ask not what is divine. It were too great a task to comprehend unless thou art what thou dost ask. Now, shortly before Johannes Scheffler, um, his birth, shortly before he was born, uh, this whole mystical spiritual movement resurfaced again in Silesia. So he was born into this climate of this spiritual inquiry and direct experience. And the idea behind this movement was to liberate religion from the bondage to the authority of the church and also the bondage to the authority of scripture. Uh, these people were interested in a higher authority, an inner voice, and they sought this through quiet introspection. These people would meet in informal gatherings. They would search for the inner light of the spirit and all around them, at this particular time and place, Catholics and Lutherans were battling. The Thirty Years' War was going on in Europe, and this ravaged much of Europe. And this was the setting into which Johannes Scheffler was born, and into which he grew to maturity. Now, after his parents died and left him considerable money, he studied medicine at three universities in Europe. In the Netherlands, he discovered the writings of Jakob Burma, the great Lutheran mystic. And in Italy, he decided to study Catholicism because he wanted to understand why it was so despised by the Protestants. And he was deeply impressed by this Catholicism and by his studies. And so at the age of 25, he wrote to a friend, Mundus pulcherimum nihil, the world is a most beautiful nothing. Now, Western theology calls this the via negativa, the way of negation. And in the Upanishads, the Vedanta tradition, this is known as the path of neti-neti. Now, the same year, 
Uh, Johannes Scheffler met Abraham von Frankenburg, who had known Jakob Burma personally. So now he's getting so that he's uh, in contact with people who knew a great mystic. And Frankenberg was both interested in mysticism and also in the physical scientists, sciences and knowing how the world would work. But he told Johannes Scheffler that even if he could not comprehend the entirety of the universe, he could still strive for that perfect union of the soul with God, not through belief, but through purity of heart. So this is the path that Johannes Scheffler took. And three years later, he found himself in trouble. He was censored by the Lutheran authorities for his mystical leanings. And so in 1653, he converted to Catholicism. Now, earlier on in life, he had a very gentle disposition, and he had gained the nickname Angel. And so when he became a Catholic, he took the, that nickname, and he became Angelus Silesius, Angelus of Silesia. He was ordained a priest in 1661, and he spent his remaining years as a propagandist for the Catholic Counter-Reformation. But he lamented privately that these external affairs of the church had torn him away from this inner search for the divine, away from that spiritual peace and gracious, gracious inwardness that he had once enjoyed. And so I'd say let this serve as a cautionary tale. And above all, let his inspired aphorisms remain his legacy. Now, the book, The Cherubinic Wanderer, was written between probably 1651 and 1653 and published in 1657. This was four years before he became a priest. It's divided into five books. And then in 1675, a second edition came out with a sixth book added. And so there, the total number of aphorisms is 1,676. Now, obviously, we're not going to have time for all of those today, but I picked about 40 of them, and some of them are quite delectable. Now, they're a loose collection of metaphysical and theological speculations, moral maxims, meditations on scripture, and spontaneous outpourings of his own personal experiences. And they range from hope and endeavor to joy. And altogether, they paint vivid pictures of phases along the spiritual journey in no particular order. And some people speculate that's maybe why this book is called The Cherubinic Wanderer. Anyway, Angelus Silesius made no claims to originality, and he acknowledged all the great mystics that he was familiar with. He says they had explored uh, that same territory before him, and most indebted of all he was to Jakob Burma, the great Lutheran mystic. And he condensed Burma's teachings into these little tiny aphorisms that are very, very bold and really make the point. Now, I was thinking, we're going to approach these gems. And then I was thinking, gems, pearls, Easter. The kids are out gathering beautiful colored Easter eggs today as we're here. So why don't we gather some pearls of wisdom? Those will be our Easter eggs. Now, every one of us is a mystic in the making. That knowledge of the all-pervading divinity is our birthright, because that reality is our true and innermost nature. The Upanishads call this the Atman, or self. And my guru, Swami Prabhavananda, always used to talk about when that vision opens up. Not if, when. Humans have this potential for self-knowledge, for God-realization. And the Vedanta says that this realization of our divine nature is life's highest purpose and the supreme goal. So the mystical journey begins here and now, exactly where we are. And we, as potential mystics, begin with our own experience of this world. Now the Hindu sacred texts tell us that knowledge comes to us through this whole process. The universe has a structure, a form, a blueprint. And so knowledge, how do we gain knowledge? First of all, there are the five senses that bring data to the mind. This creates what we call perceptual knowledge, the knowledge of objects, of other living beings, of things that we can define in this world. Then the mind gets to work processing this, and it develops a higher, subtler level of knowledge called conceptual knowledge, concepts, ideas, abstractions, principles. And then we interact with this world on that basis. 
And our whole interaction with this world is a process of information coming in and then a response that we uh, project outward. So our activities are mental, they're emotional, and they're physical. And this is true of mystics as well. They experience the same world that we do, but in them, this other dimension has been awakened. They have a fuller vision that has opened up. So above this perceptual knowledge and the conceptual knowledge, above you know, the physical and the abstract, there is this higher, subtler way of knowing still, and this is called intuitive knowledge. Now, intuitive knowledge is hard to define, but it is closer to grasping the true essence of things. Now, when the young Johannes Scheffler wrote that the world is the most beautiful nothing, the via negativa, he did not deny the existence of the world. He said the world is, but a most beautiful nothing. It is insubstantial, fleeting. Everything constantly changes. Nothing lasts. But that's the cosmic play, or drama, if you will. It can be very beautiful. So are we to deny the beauty of a sunset just because it is evanescent? Are we to deny that moment of music that uplifts us and puts our soul into rapture just because it's only a fleeting moment? Why would we deny such beauty that uplifts and inspires us and wants us to be better? Why would we want to deny something that gives us a sense of something greater than ourselves? The mistake is to see beauty as only the surface attraction for pleasure and not as an expression of the divine. If we see beauty in those ways, it will not serve us on the spiritual journey. Instead, it becomes a distraction or an obstacle. And Angelus Silesius made that very clear. Now, here's the poem he wrote about that. If thou dost love a something, man, thou lovest not that doth abide. God is not this nor that. Do thou leave somethings utterly aside. So if you can't see God in it, it's not worth your time. <laughs> Angelus Silesius warned about the attractiveness of all these mundane things and the attachment to all the somethings that do not last. The folly is in holding on to something that will eventually crumble to dust. These somethings that we find attractive and claim as our own will eventually slip through our fingers. Now, Hindu scriptures call God the imperishable, and tell us to seek for that alone if we would find lasting peace and fulfillment. Angela said, God is not this nor that. The rishis of the Upanishads say, neti neti atma. The soul, the self, is neither this nor that. The divine self is not a something that we can sense or think about or express in words. It's beyond that. And as for all these somethings, Angela's cautioned that if we see them as a part from God, rather than as a part of God, we should leave them completely alone. Does this mean we are to disparage or despise the things of the world? No. Angelus recognized the world and everything in it, us included, as an expression of the divine. And here's how he put this into a poem. A loaf holds many grains of wheat, and many myriad drops the sea. So is God's oneness multitude, and that great multitude are we. Now this calls to mind two passages from Upanishads. The first one is the Chandogya Upanishad. Sarvam kaluidam brahma tajalaniti. All this universe is truly Brahman. From that all things originate, in that they dissolve, by that they are sustained. And the second passage comes from the Shaitasrata Upanishad. One should know nature surely to be Maya, and the great Lord to be the Lord of Maya, but also this whole world to be filled with beings who are his parts. Now, if everything is infused with divinity, why don't we respect it? If we recognize the divine presence everywhere, even in ourselves, we're bound to feel joy and peace. Now, in our ordinary experience, we're not yet aware of that simple truth. And we accept this realm of duality as this arena that life plays out against. We have these inevitable opposites of pleasure and pain, enjoyment and suffering, good and evil, beauty, ugliness. 
And so it's interesting because this is what Angelus attacks here. He uh, addresses this subject. He uses the rose as a metaphor for beauty. But listen to what he has to say about the rose. Beauty I dearly love, and yet I think that beauty scarce adorns aught that I see, unless I find it always set about with thorns. You can't have the rose without the thorns. That's a beautiful image for the nature of duality. And it brings out this quintessential problem with duality, the fact that there are these pluses and minuses. Where there is one, there is the other. Because all the opposites are mutually self-defining. You can't have the one without the other. If it was all beauty and there was no concept even of ugliness, how could you even recognize the beauty? So we have to transcend both and leave this attachment and this aversion aside. The spiritual way to do that is to cultivate the spirit of dispassion and equanimity. And that leads us to see the world with a wisdom that begins to reveal at least the glimpse of its true nature, those flashes of divinity. Angelus Silesius comes to affirm the world as God's creation. Earlier he had said it was the most beautiful nothing. Now he's affirming it as God's creation. And he says that it reflects at least to some degree God's perfection. The rose, which here thou seest with thine outward eye, hath blossomed in God from all eternity. So everything is in God. Everything is God's own expression. And so here, Angelus leaves behind this via negativa, the path of neti neti, and embraces the path of iti iti, the via positiva, as it is known in Western theology. He says, beauty is born of love alone. The countenance divine hath all its loveliness from love, else it would cease to shine. So the vision that he presents here is a vision of a world luminous with the divine presence, hath all its loveliness from love, else it would cease to shine. Love, light. And again, I know God's countersign. His signature is writ in every creature. Canst thou but interpret it? So it's there for the seeing. But how do we go about that? In a word, receptivity allowing ourselves to be open to that vision that will open up. And again, here's what Angelus has to say, and he's getting a little provocative here, which I like. This is one of his techniques. Not as imperfect, man. Pebble is analog of ruby. Seraph, not more beautiful than frog. So here we have the ingrained ideas of duality beginning to break down. Old patterns begin to change. Do we see different things? No. Do we see things differently? Yes, most certainly so. So there is beauty, there's divinity everywhere, not only where we're told to expect it. For the mystic, this vision is a glow with the divine unity. A pebble is as beautiful as a sparkling gem. And a frog is no less beautiful than an angel. So this is an openness to what is spiritual, and this transforms our vision. And Angelus wrote, No motes of dust are so contemptible and small, but that the wise see God all glorious in them all. Now to ordinary ears, this may sound provocative, even shocking perhaps, but it's common to the mystic, because the mystic's vision has been freed from all these constraints of conventionality. Now, Angelus was aware that he would face objections from ordinary believers, non-mystical people, and he most certainly did. But he had an answer for them. And again, his answer was provocative. Since thou dost measure God by creature qualities, there's more of lie than truth in thy theologies. <laughs> now, if we think of compelling beauty only as apart from the divine, then... It has no true value. And consider what Sri Ramakrishna said. The universe and its created beings and the 24 cosmic principles all exist because God exists. Nothing remains if God is eliminated. The number increases if you put many zeros after the figure one. But the zeros don't have any value if the one is not there. I'm sure you've all heard that teaching. Okay, more than two centuries earlier, this is what Angelus Silesius wrote. 
The creature, which is nullity, denoted the zero. If it come in front of God, placed after him, it giveth value to the sum. So here, in this context, Angelus is saying that the life of any soul that puts God itself before God amounts to nothing. But the soul that follows God in humility realizes the true value of its own existence. Otherwise, this allurement of the creation becomes our object of pursuit and then the object of our bondage. But once you are possessed by this mystic vision, you, don't, you no longer long to possess that beauty. How can a single soul grasp and hold on to that which is everywhere? And the Isha Upanishad also begins, this first verse says that we should become immersed in all this, all this creation. We are to become immersed in the divinity of it because it is God. Now Angelus is no longer renouncing the world, but he has chosen to embrace the world. And he writes, Dost thou complain that creatures thwart thy Godward road? How so? To me all creatures are a way to God. And this brings to mind the story in the Srimad Bhagavata Purana of the young mendicant who roamed around, met a king. The king said, You have nothing, you're poor, but I see peace and joy and happiness on your face. Tell me. How did this happen? I'm a king, I have power, I have everything, I'm miserable. And the young mendicant <laughs> said, I've walked around the world and observed it. And I learned from 24 teachers. And then he names all the teachers and what they taught him. The five physical elements, the moon, the sun, various animals, birds, insects, various people, including a honey gatherer, a maiden, a prostitute, and an arrow maker. And from them, he learned lessons such as forbearance, poise, dispassion, purity, contentment, the value of goodness for its own sake, and a host of other virtues conducive to inner peace. And at last, he found in his own humanity the potential for self-knowledge. We can do the same. So the world, is it going to be a source of bondage? Only if we let it. Or is it going to be a path to freedom through right understanding? There are teachers all around. Now, Hindu teaching speaks of human birth as the requisite for the enlightenment or liberation of the soul. This only happens to humans. So human birth is a great privilege, a great treasure. And Angelus also recognized this intrinsic worth of the human heart. He wrote this, God, devil, and the world would all invade my heart. Such rivalry doth prove it to be wondrous fair and of a high nobility. And then concerning the world, he wrote, the hidden God becometh known in general to mankind in the created world of things which he hath fashioned and designed. So God makes the world for his own delight. This is called Brahma Lila, the divine play. It is utterly spontaneous. It's not predetermined. It's an outpouring of divine joy. Now, this concept is foreign to <clears throat> mainstream Judeo-Christian theology, but not to the mystics of those traditions. And so Angelus declares this, All this is but a game which God fashioneth for himself alone. He hath devised the world of things, not for the thing's sake, but his own. Again, the Brahmalila. So the problem is not with the world, but with our attitudes. It's all about us. This is what we think. The world is all about us. And so misunderstanding arises from the ego, this small and trifling sense of individual selfhood that can make life so difficult. And Angela said, To thee the world is very wide. A lump of earth is adamant. A molehill is a mountain range. The reason is thou art an ant. So he's trying to impress on people the insignificance of the individual human ego. Now, the human embodiment is a state of extreme limitation. There's limitation of knowledge, limitation of ability, limitation in time and space, a limitation that manifests as a sense of lack, an existential lack. Something is missing. There's always a hole there that needs to be filled. So the ego equals the misidentification of the true self, the Atman, with all that which it is not. 
So it is a misidentification of the infinite with the finite. And Angelus understood that. He wrote, my spirit is a partial being. It yearns to be recentered in that essence whence it broke away, its primal root and origin. So we have this longing for God because that is our true nature. Now the ego sees everything else in the world in terms of I, me, and mine. We have the sense of personal identity that is based on this, and we become held hostage to the outer circumstances of our lives and to the inner conditions that we create in our own minds. Now, who can we blame for this? Well, Angelus had some thoughts on this. He said, the world doth not imprison thee, thou art thyself the world, and there within thyself thou holdst thyself, thyself imprisoned prisoner. And then again, with the insight of a yogi, he wrote, all heaven is within thee, man, and all of hell within thy heart. What thou dost choose and will to have, that hast thou wheresoever thou art. So heaven and hell are not these afterlife destinations in a religious sense. They are states of consciousness in the here and now. Heaven is the blissfulness of right understanding. Hell, the state of suffering brought on by our existential ignorance. Now this ignorance is closely tied to the human ego. And so one of the prescriptions on the spiritual path is to surrender that ego to the divine will. Now this, now that, thou strivest to shape with thine own eye for instrument. Ah, oh, wouldst thou but let God shape all according to his own intent. It's interesting because Sri Ramakrishna also used the word instrument in connection with the ego. He spoke of himself as the instrument and God as the operator. And similarly, this personal pronoun I, Sri Ramakrishna used that to signify the ego. The unripe I had to ripen into the I of knowledge, the I of a devotee, the I of a servant, the I of a child. And Angelus wrote also, the more the I in me doth fail, diminish, and sink lower, so much the more the I of God aggrandizeth its power. So surrender to the divine will. It should be easy. It should be an agreeable task. And yes, it should be. But the will is an obstacle. And so Angelus recognized this. Not is there mightier than God, yet hath he not the might to turn my will from willing what it will, my yearning as it needs must yearn? And again, by thine own will thou art lost, by thine own will thou art found. Thou by the will art freed, and by thy will art bound. Sri Ramakrishna said almost the same thing when he said it is the mind that binds us and the mind that sets us free. So the message here is that the human will can be an obstacle or we can make it into an asset. If we direct the will properly, making a constant effort either toward self-surrender or to directing the mind consciously toward God, then this will of ours is a positive tool. But again, easier said than done. And so Sri Ramakrishna and Angela Silesius are both aware of the worldly temptations. Ramakrishna would advise householders every now and then retire into solitude for several days at a time and live a contemplative life, become firmly established in your spiritual habits. And Angelus also wrote about seclusion. If thou wouldst shun these strangers, bride, who seek to be thy paramours, then close the casement shutters fast and linger not at open doors. Now the imagery here is interesting. He refers to the soul as a bride. And this is a direct refer reference to the Song of Songs in the Jewish Bible. The Song of Songs is a mystical book of poetry that celebrates the spiritual journey as a passionate romance between the soul and God. And so Angelus here is advising solitude, just like Sri Ramakrishna did. The closed room is a symbol of the methodology of yoga. Go into the room and close the shutters, he's saying. Take refuge from worldly attractions and distractions. Let the mind retire into itself. This is called pratyahara in the yoga school, the closing of the doors of the senses and the withdrawing of the mind from exterior objects. 
So potentially defined yoga is the cessation of the mind's activity. When the thought waves are stilled, the true original nature of consciousness is realized, and one is known to be the pure, unconditioned, infinite self, Purusha, Atman, Brahman. Angelus wrote, the more thyself out of thyself thou canst dischannel and outpour, the more must God flow into thee, with all his godhood more and more. And again, not bringeth thee beyond thyself so surely as self-nullity. Self the more thou canst annul thyself, the more thou hast of deity. So get that ego out of the way. Get rid of that limited individual sense of selfhood. That is the obstacle. And here's one of my favorite poems of all. Um, it's paradoxical, and paradox is also a part of mysticism. So this poem is a real delight. God, whose extreme delight it is to dwell with thee, doth come most willingly into thy house when thou art not at home. <laughs> now, light is another universal theme we find in mystical writing. And we even speak of the spiritual goal as enlightenment. So physical light guides us to some extent, and there's a long teaching in the Upanishad all about physical light first being our guide, and then subtler and subtler forms of light, going all the way to the light of the self, the Atman or Brahman. And Swami Brahmananda, uh, my Paramaguru, the guru of Swami uh, Prabhavananda, at one time exclaimed, light, more light, is there any end to it? And so this light is infinite. And Angelus wrote, I am amazed that thou dost yearn for daylight to appear. There is no sunset in my soul. Day is already here. And this divine light transfigures. The world doth pass away? Nay, the world stands its ground. What God destroys is but the night that wraps it round. And so here, the night that wraps it round, he's referring to what we call maya. Angelus recognized this principle, and he didn't know Sanskrit. These teachings weren't known in Europe at the time. He called this principle of maya accident. And he called Brahman essence. And of course, essence is sat, so this is very close to Hindu teaching. Angelus wrote that it is maya that hides our true identity and causes us to believe that we are something else. All accident must go, all false appearances. Put off thy specious hues, be pure as essence is. Become essential, man. When the world fails at last, accident falls away, but essence, that stands fast. In other words, maya dissolves and all that remains is Brahman. So these two verses also paraphrase Shankar's very famous dictum. Brahma satyam jagamitya jivo brahma ivanapraha. Brahman is the true reality. This constantly moving world is misleading and the individual soul is none other than Brahman. So when this veil of maya is pierced, this ultimate transfiguration can take place. Now, speaking of transfiguration, changing one thing into another, during Angelus' lifetime, alchemy was still widely practiced in Europe. And of course, for the worldly-minded, this was all about transforming base metals into gold and becoming rich. But the true alchemy was the alchemy of the spirit, process of spiritual transformation. And so for Angelus, alchemy meant the end of maya and the attainment of union with the divine. Then lead becometh gold, then accident is ended. When I with God, through God, in God, I am wholly blended. So what is in the way to all of this is our unknowing, our forgetfulness of our true divine nature, the condition of beta, or difference. Angelus calls this otherness, the idea that I somehow am different from God, I am different from that. And there are two problems. Um, there is this, the fact that this otherness is an obstacle and the fact that this, <clears throat> the solution is that the absence of otherness becomes enlightenment. And so there are two poems that uh, address these themes. What only difference lies twixt me and God? Confess, I'll tell you in a word, nothing but otherness. In other words, it's the Maya that gets in the way. 
Of otherness, the blessed soul hath lost the very sense. It is a single light with God and one magnificence. So the mystical experience is one of indescribable joy. And Angelus wrote about God's own self-contained joy, which we call ananda in Sanskrit. God is so super beautiful that he beholdeth in a trance of rapture from eternity the splendor of his countenance, this self-recognition, this divine knowledge, divine self-knowledge, a splendor of and a rapture. So we have this imagery of light and resplendence, time and eternity. This is very prominent in mystical poetry. And Angelus has some insights that he wants to share on time and eternity. Time gets linked to what is perishable, everything that comes and goes. And this is what leads to our fundamental sense of unease, our existential distress. The true and proper worth of things who undertaketh to essay will never sorrow over much for that which time can bear away. So in other words, viveka, discrimination, stick with what's permanent and lasting. The title of another poem, which I will not quote, is quite wonderful. God is all at once. And that could be a sutra in itself. God is all at once. The eternal now, the moment, which is all we have. But we lose it, or we think we do. And Angelus puts the blame, or perhaps we should say the responsibility, on us. And there are two poems about this. Tis thou thyself that makest time, and like a clock thy senses run. But do thou, do thou but quiet their unrest. The clock is stopped, and time is gone. And I'm sure some of you have, in deep meditation, experienced something that gives you at least a glimmer of what this is about. Eternity is one with time, time with eternity, and hence non-difference between them lies. Thyself dost make the difference. So this difference, this beta, it marks the world of multiplicity. The abeda, the non-difference, is the non-dual wholeness, the unity. Now, Angela says that this can be experienced in consciousness. This is where we do experience it. Thinking that we are finite in time and space and subject to causation, finite we become. But knowing that we are the infinite Atman, Brahman, leads us to know that we are free in the internal, imperishable oneness of our true being. But how can the finite know the infinite? It can't. But here's how the Mundaka Upanishad expresses it. Just as the flowing rivers, leaving behind their names and forms, merge into the ocean, so does the knowing one, freed from name and form, attain the all-transcending reality. Whoever knows the Supreme Brahman becomes Brahman. And quite remarkably, Angelus wrote this. When to the sea at last it comes, the smallest drop becometh sea. Even so, thy soul becometh God, when God at last absorbeth thee. Not ever can be known in God, one and alone is he. To know him, knower must be one with known. So the essence of mysticism is the experience of this absolute unity underlying all of creation. It is a taintless and untaintable state of beatitude. And in wonder, Angelus exclaimed, I know not what to do. All things are one to me. Place, unplace, day, night, joy, pain, time, eternity. So he had the sense of his own self in all things and of all things in the self. In Sanskrit, one of the words to describe this state is vishwa prema, which means universal love. It's an all-consuming love in which your own sense of individuality melts away in rapt adoration. Now, God is love. This is often said, so often, in fact, that it may have become for you a facile platitude. And in this sense of mystical experience, though, God truly is love. It's something that is felt at the core of one's being, more than just a feeling. It's also a knowing. And this fact is made clear in Christian scripture, which Angelus Silesius, of course, certainly knew. The first epistle of John declares, He that loveth not knoweth not God, 
for God is love. And Angelus agreed. Love is God's nature. He can do not else. Wouldst thou be God, then likewise love in every instance now. And there are two more poems. One is that the love is the simplest of paths, but he gives us a word of caution. Pass through love's gate if thou wouldst go the shortest way to God. Who takes the path of knowledge long must tarry on the road. Climb not too high, frame no unneedful subtleties. The finest wisdom is to be not overwise. So basically what he's saying is love is simplicity. And this is the easy path. And this is what Sri Ramakrishna always taught too. Bhakti yoga is the simplest path to God. But its cultivation is not always that easy. Love is a sadhana, a spiritual practice. And it requires constant diligence, unwavering attention. Love must be practiced until it becomes our very nature. And as for the people who take the path of knowledge, we can get so caught up in overthinking things that we are just trapped in this distraction. So love must be practiced until it becomes our very nature. To practice love is burdensome. Tis not enough merely to love. We must ourselves, like God, be love. That is the fullness of the commitment that devotion, true devotion, calls for. And since God is love, the more of love we cultivate, the more of God we find in our hearts. But this spiritual life does require that total involvement. Now, some people will say, does this mean I have to forsake my family, turn my back on friends, or neglect all of my mundane responsibilities? No, of course not. The secret is to love and serve God in everyone we know, in every action. If we seek God within ourselves, and if we acknowledge that that same God dwells in everyone else, then every action and interaction, however menial, becomes an act of worship. This is the definition of karma yoga. And here we have Angelus echoing uh, a famous phrase uh, from the book of Acts, which also is quoted by a lot of Vedantic teachers, including Swami Prabhavananda. All creatures live and move and have their being in God. Why must thou then needs ask, which is the heavenward road? He's cautioning here that the spiritual journey along this heavenward road is not for the faint-hearted. That's what comes in this next poem. And again, it's one of those delicious paradoxes. If thou dost sail thy little ship upon the sea of deity, it were indeed a happy chance shouldst thou be drowned in that great sea. So the sutra saying, let your ship sink. But this is letting the ego be subsumed into that greater reality of the true self, the Atman Brahman. So Angelus is talking about total immersion in the Supreme. And in that total immersion, nothing is lost and everything is gained. That is because the small, lower self merges into the infinite self that is God. Our finitude melts into infinity and we recognize our true being. The effort is ours to make, and as the final poem of the Cherubinic Wanderer reminds us, friend, it is now enough. Wouldst thou read more, go hence, become thyself the writing, and thyself the sense. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishyate Om Shanti 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 Filled full with Brahman are the things that we see. Filled full with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman floweth all. Yet is it still the same. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.